courtesy of Rad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome to the Backup Goalie Show. I'm Dan alongside Matt, and as always, we're back for another episode of Fireside Chat. And uh, we're ending off the Flames' longest road trip of the season, and very uh, eventful week, hasn't it been, Matt? Yeah, it's not often you see three different goalies in the span of one road trip, so it's good that David Riddick got his first NHL win, and a good way to finish off that road trip. I mean, if we look at this trip, and we talked about the first half last week, but Mike Smith started the trip injured, Matthew Kachuk got suspended, the Flames blew a 4-3 to lead against the Stars, Eddie Lack got sent to the AHL, Riddick got called up. There's been a lot that's happened in the last, what, week and a half the Flames have been gone? Yeah, it's been very event- eventful for a team that has had no trades. <laughs> and even uh, Christopher Stee got hurt, and he'll be missing most of the upcoming homestand. I think one of the interesting things about this, if you listen to some of the players and the media they've done, there's always that one road trip every year where the guys seem to bond. And it seems like being away for so long and having things like the train ride we talked about last week, it seems like this was the trip where the team really got that much closer. And I'm glad it's happening early because since we've seen the Flames have not gone on that trip until January, February, when it's almost too late. Oh, for sure. And... With the Flames being somewhat successful, getting seven points in the six games, at least they held their own despite all the turmoil of the weeks that they were on the road. Well, let's talk about the last three games of the week, the three that we didn't talk about last week. The Calgary Flames uh, rolled into Columbus where they took on the Columbus Blue Jackets. Josh Anderson scored the only goal of the game in overtime while Bobrovsky recorded a 22-save shutout. I said last week I had a strong feeling even though the Flames make the overtime, they would end up not winning this, and it turns out I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I was overconfident saying, oh, the Flames are awesome in overtime and got you to change your mind. It's got to stop somewhere though, right? Yeah. Well, I did honestly, not expect it to be 0-0 zero, zero after regulation, though. No, and honestly, the Flames uh, were bailed out by Mike Smith in that game. They did not play a, a very good game against Columbus and were, frankly, lucky to get the one point. Um, Columbus is a very good team, and they're one of the top te- five teams in the NHL, and they were last year. And it's hard to score on Bobrovsky. He's a probably the best current starter in the NHL and the Jackets have a defense core to match they can't score obviously either (laughs) but uh you know if they ever do figure out how to put the puck in the net they're going to be an extremely dangerous team and they could be a contender for the Eastern Conference this year and potentially push for a Stanley Cup Finals berth It could be really interesting to watch them play against one of the Eastern Conference teams um, that's very offensive and see how that difference in those two styles would mesh. Yeah, uh, looking forward to the first Columbus-Tampa matchup. That'll be fun. I think that may be the first time that anybody has ever said they're looking forward to a Columbus-Tampa matchup. (laughs) I'm surprised how good Tampa's been the last couple years. I mean, we saw them good when they beat the Flames, and then they were sort of mediocre. But for a team, you know, in the middle of of Florida, they're doing pretty well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And Steve Eiserman, I think, is probably the best current general manager in the NHL. So he's done a lot of good with not so much in terms of resources to keep that team a top-notch contender year in, year out. Well, the next game on the Flames road trip, the second to last, the Calgary Flames rolled into Dallas, and this was quite a disappointing game for Flames fans. The Flames held a 4-3 to lead in this one, ended up blowing the lead and losing 6-4 to to Dallas. Thoughts on this one, Matt? Uh, this was a game where... You're happy that for the Gaudreau line for scoring as many times as they did. And everybody else should hang their head in shame. It, that was a pathetic effort by basically everybody else that was a member of the Calgary Flames. 
This was, I believe, uh, Glenn Gulletson called this after the game, a night of self-inflicted wounds. The Flames were making mistakes that weren't forced mistakes, and they were just turning that puck over too much. And anytime you do that against a team like Dallas, I think Dallas is one of the teams in the NHL that's on the rise. Anytime you give Dallas the puck, they're going to make you pay. Oh, I know. And you it was evident on the game-winning goal by Tyler Sagan. Dougie Hamilton had all the time in the world. All he had to do was lift the puck out of the zone. And instead, he chips it off the boards right to where Tyler Sagan is and allows the lane right through, and he scores. And it's like, you didn't need to do that. Like, you have the entire ice to shoot at. You know, you can... Even if you put it up the middle, there was nobody there. You know, it, it just... Come on, Matt. It's easy to mistake white for green. True. Sure. You know, but it's the same as the overtime goal in Columbus. Like, TJ Brody just coughed the puck up needlessly in overtime and just gave the puck away for an easy tap-in for Anderson. So, it's been a problem for a good portion of the season where the players are just making really like fundamentally basic mistakes that you don't normally even see at the NHL level at, at all and like even at junior levels like you don't usually see like oh here's the leading scorer on their team here have the puck you know like it just they the flames as a whole need to tighten up their game overall like it, i think it's it's, it's a lot the defenders too it's not i mean it is some of the forwards but i'm noticing mostly from the blue liners yeah and it, it's it's one of those things that you can handle the defensemen making mistakes if they're generating offense but the Flames defenders outside of TJ Brody have not really been generating a, mu a huge amount of offense overall. So, like, they should be taking care of their own zone better. If It would be different if they were producing more, but they're not. And it's just frustrating to see because of the fact that, like, a lot of the mistakes they're making are, like, really basic mistakes. And they should not be doing this at this point like it, we're two months into the season and like the system didn't change from last year so like there's not really any excuse like there's no TJ contract Brody isn't looking great no like there's no contract holdouts or anything like that like okay yeah Brody's playing with a new defensive partner but it, it like uh, honestly with Brody I think a lot of his problem is the coaching staff and TJ Brody is a left shooting right side defender and he's being used on the left side and I think that's messing up his game because he's looked off last year and he's looked off all season this year and it it just uh, he doesn't seem comfortable out there defensively and you know I don't know how uh, with the current coaching staff if that'll ever change it's quite frustrating because of the fact that he's not as bad as he's been defensively i also think that one of the big guys that we're seeing struggle and is frustrating is travis hamanick i mean i never expected travis to be a top say offensive defenseman he's always been more of a defensive defenseman in my eyes but even hamanick doesn't seem to be playing great and i don't know if it's Brody's pulling Hamannick down, or Hamannick's pulling Brody down. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting that when Hamannick came back for the first game after his injury, it, for half the game he was put on the third pairing, and Stone was moved up to his spot. And Brody played better without Hamannick and with Stone, and Kulak played better with Hamannick, and Hamannick played better with Kulak. And it almost makes you wonder if that should actually be a permanent thing because of the fact that last year Stone and Brody played very well together for the entire time that they were together and didn't seem to have any problems. And yet with Hamannick, it just it, they don't seem to be on the same page. And we saw this with Hamilton when he first arrived. It took him two months to figure out how to adapt to the flame system it's just 
frustrating that like it's not coming together yet and hopefully it will soon it's just maybe a personnel change might be more in order we'll see yeah i don't think you can put your defensive pairings together based on salary which is kind of what they've done now i like uh Brody and Stone. We saw them at the end of last season. I thought they were a good pairing. I don't think Stone's necessarily your full-time number four, but Brody's obviously comfortable with them. And maybe putting Brody with Stone for, you know, a couple weeks to a month just to bring that confidence back up and then put him and Hamannick back together might be just what we need. Yeah, I'm thinking very much along the same line. And it also would help Brett Kulak to play with a guy like Hamannick and might help him further his game a bit because he could because Hamilton Hamannick is so good defensively that it can allow Kulak to explore a little bit more of his offensive game that he would normally be a little bit reticent to do with Stone being his partner I think in that case you almost get to having you know, your your second and third defensive pairings, I would say almost equal. And that's also interesting because now you can almost roll defensive pairings. Um, I mean, the first pairing isn't looking all that hot either, but you could almost give, if you wanted to, everybody equal time and see who does the best and, you know, the next game move off from that. Yeah, and you look at, like, say, five-on-five five play, you could easily make it where it's basically even and then just whichever guys for the power play and penalty kill that get the more ice time in those situations get more ice time overall but well just... yeah and that can be where you mix them up too you know maybe on the pp or pk you put say giordano and brody back together yeah and like one thing that i've been a little frustrated with is the first defense uh the first power play unit not having uh both the Giordano and Hamilton on it like it was so effective last year uh there was not and each of them had pretty much career-ish years offensively it, it seems a little strange that they've went away with from that when you have two of the best offensive defensemen in the league to not... It's not just on the blue line, though. I mean, they've been doing some weird stuff with special teams all over the place. We've seen Brower and Stajan on the special teams. I scratch my head and wonder what Dave Cameron's up to sometimes. Yeah, well, we'll be talking about that a little later, <laughs> more in depth. Well, before we talk about the third game of the week, we have to lay down a little bit of groundwork here, and we'll talk more about the actual moves later on. But before this game, the we had come into this week saying this would probably be when the Flames' backup goaltender would play. Uh, we all figured that the backup goalie would end up playing in Colorado because it lent itself well to that second night of a back-to-back -back against a team that's supposed to be a fairly weak team. And... We saw Eddie Lack waved before this game. I wasn't expecting that. And in this, uh, just for this game, David Riddick recalled from the AHL Stockton Heat, and Riddick went in the net. And I'm proud to say the Calgary Flames now 1 0 0 when David Riddick starts. The Calgary Flames got a big win in this one, winning 3 2 over the Avalanche. And Riddick looked, I would say, making 24 saves, looked about as good as he can in this game. Yeah. Uh, the. Two goals that he surrendered were probably not as good of goals to to allow, but he also made a number of excellent saves as well that could have easily been goals. So on the whole, I think he had a very strong night. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how many more starts he gets, especially with the schedule being a little more condensed heading into December and how effective he will be in those games and it, it'll be interesting to see the flames are giving a kid a shot and that's the important thing and eddie lack has struggled pretty much his entire time being a flame so allowing him to get some starts in the ahl and maybe rebuild his confidence there in case the kids falter allows him to get a little better and get give the kids some shots so that way they can see what they have because you're going to need to make a decision on guys like Riddick and Gilly sooner than later so they need to see what they have in those players 
Well, let's talk a little bit about this uh, Avalanche game, and then we'll come back to the goaltenders. I don't know about you, I didn't think that Riddick got really any A-quality shots in the first. I thought this was a good period to ease him into the NHL level. There were some shots, but none of them were. I really thought, wow, those, you know, those were some fantastic shots. I thought the Flames really dominated that first period, and we saw the Dougie Hamilton goal, and that was the only scoring. I did think, though, the Avalanche took over in the second period. I thought the Flames were badly outplayed for most of the game. I really couldn't believe that the Flames were able to steal two goals in the last, what, two minutes here? It like, was the last minute. It, 50 seconds and 35 seconds remaining or something like crazy. that. That's crazy. Like, we saw the one. I thought, okay, we're going to go into the uh, the break with the Flames up by one on Furland's goal, and then Backlund gets one. And I think that quick minute there really shifted the momentum of the game. Oh, for sure. And anytime you get a last minute goal, it's a good thing. It, getting two is even better. And frankly, the Flames did a good job of limiting the Avalanche in the third period, uh, keeping them at bay, even though they controlled most of the play in the third period. It, they still weren't allowing a lot of good shots. At they Riddick. only allowed seven shots in the third period. Yeah. They blocked a good, fair number of them, though, which. Honestly, that's a, one thing that I think that the Flames' defense has been lacking a little bit this year is the willingness to block shots. We haven't bring seen. Chris Russell back. Yeah, well, I wouldn't go that far. Not desperate for some Oilers cast off, but anyhow, um, the Flames like they haven't. They've been allowing Mike Smith to see basically every shot possible this year, and. I don't know. Like it's one of those things where, yeah, he can stop them, but it also helps to take some of the pressure off the goaltender by blocking some shots. And like, unless Smith is basically saying don't block shots when he's starting, then you know, I I just don't see. You know, it, it's one of those things that it seems to have been missing from this year's team. And Well, I thought this was actually quite a bit better defensive effort from the Flames overall in this game. It's one of those things that you see, like, the goalie wants to get involved in a game, and that's understandable, but the defense need to get involved in the game, and I think that's part of what they need to do to be involved and play better overall is to block shots and be focused on doing all the little things and they haven't really been able to do that thus far this year and I'm wondering that perhaps the Flames should start blocking a lot more shots not to interfere with Smith but just to get their own game going and I think the reticence to do that over the first couple months I think is partially lending to these little mental mistakes that have crept into their game. I think it's partly shot blocking. I think it's partly positioning. They're letting the guys come down too deep in the zone. They're letting them get out in front. I think there's a lot of things that need to be tightened up. I'm hesitant to say they need to block more shots because we always see shot blockers get hurt. And right now, I really don't want to see Flames defensemen getting hurt. But I think it's definitely a tool in the arsenal. I think it was Glenn Gullitson who said last year, if they're blocking a shot, it means they failed to take away the offensive chance. And I agree with them to some extent. I think shot blocking should be a last ditch effort, but I think especially our defensemen need to be more physical and they need to be, you know, putting the body on a lot more of these guys. They're coming into the zone and not letting them get so far into our zone before we try to either hit them or take the puck away. Oh, I know. And especially with a goaltender like Smith, uh, who's going to be starting most of the games. If you force the, the players that are coming into the zone to dump the puck in, then at the blue line, then Smith's able to get the puck and pass it out. And so that's what they should be doing is forcing things at the blue line where either you have to beat the defender one on one, which doesn't happen very often, or you have to dump it in. And it it just makes things a lot more difficult on the on rushing team. And I don't see the Flames doing that this year when they did last year, frankly. And it's just an interesting departure from like last year they were a lot more effective at limiting how quickly the other team entered the flame zone 
And uh, you know, I still think we need to give the time uh, the team a little time on that because I think having a goaltender like Mike Smith, who plays very differently, might be affecting how the defensemen think they need to be playing. And I think there's an adjustment period there, but I think we're almost at the end of the rope for how long we can give them. It, and that's why, like, I know I haven't mentioned anything like this in our past episodes because of the fact that. Well, it's an adjustment period, and but we're at the end of November, so like it's time for the team to be playing appropriately now. Like it, it's we're two months into the season. Come on. Well, as we wrap up this road trip, some interesting stats: the Flames are now forty-one zero and one when leading after two periods. David Riddick stopped twenty-four of twenty-six shots for his first win against Colorado. The Flames came home with seven of a possible 12 points, going 3-2-1 and one on the road trip. And if you take a look at the stats right now, Mike Smith has more points this season than Matt Bartkowski, Matt Stajan, and Tanner Glass combined. As we come home, the Calgary Flames now sit third in the Pacific Division behind Las Vegas and Los Angeles. So still sitting in a fairly good position. Not sure how Vegas crept ahead of us, but we're in a good position right now. Yeah, well... The thing is, is that like it, if Calgary does tighten up these little minor things that are going on, and they start getting performances from their bottom six, which we'll talk about shortly, then the we flames. Can beat Vegas? Sh- well, not just Vegas, but pretty much anyone. It's just that it's like the Flames are still getting in their own way. And it's preventing them from being as successful as they could be. And frankly, they should be doing better right now than they are. And they should be like three or four wins further ahead than where they are right now. So it's one of those things that they need to get everybody on the same page so that way things can flow a little bit better and they can start racking up the W's. Well, Matt, should we move over to the big goalie discussion of the week? Discussing every goalie pretty much in the system, not named Mike Smith? Sure, why not? Sounds like a plan. After the Columbus game, we heard Eddie Lack was waived, put on waivers to be sent to the AHL. I've I've said for the last couple shows, I think this might be a good idea. I don't think it's Lack being banished to the AHL forever. I think it's Probably Lack going down to get a couple starts. But first question for you. When you saw Lack on waivers, did you think anyone might claim him? I thought Vegas might just because of the fact that they, they're they still having goaltender issues there. Maybe Edmonton because Brassois is not very good. I thought if Niemi can get claimed twice, Lack will probably get claimed once. Yeah, and he didn't, so that's fine for us so uh, we have a good ahl backup now and we'll see how he does in the a so we saw david riddick come up riddick looked pretty good looking at the schedule in the span of the next about five weeks the flames have three sets of back-to-back games as well if you take a look at the schedule coming up on uh, this thursday the 30th they play arizona they have a couple games coming up against edmonton there's some interesting opportunity here for another goaltender. Some people would say keep David Riddick here. Some people would say maybe we should swap Gillies and Riddick out. What what would you be doing if you were the coach? How would you be divvying up some of those either back-to-backs or, say, games where you probably have a backup penciled in already in the schedule? Well, frankly, uh, in terms of long-term, it's better for the Flames to keep playing David Riddick. And the reason being is that he's 25 years old and is set to be a free agent at the end of the year. And the Flames need to know if he's worth keeping in the system. And the only he's doing a fantastic job in Stockton and did last year. But now you need to see, is this guy an NHL goaltender? And he may be good enough to be the backup next year. And he may end up being good enough to be the starter moving forward. It's possible because goalies, you never know. So, But you just don't know until you play him at an NHL level and he will sort himself out. He'll either play great, in which case, 
great, you have a job. Or he'll play terribly, in which case you swap him with Gillies or Lack and roll out the rest of the season. So you think you pretty much let Riddich keep going as long as he looks good? Yeah, pretty much. And like if Riddich has Riddick has a couple of games where he looks like Lack did in the Detroit game, then you move on. But it you have to give him the opportunity to either sink or swim. And he did fairly well last year in his one period of play. He did fairly well against Colorado. You just don't know. And as long as he keeps playing well, keep throwing him out there. And control who he's playing against. Like You don't want him going up against the Chicago or something like that. But you know, anytime you have opportunities, like say against Arizona, throw them out there. And well, looking at the next month, I mean, we, we've got Arizona on Thursday. Would you play them against Arizona? Sure. I don't we know if Mike Smith will allow that though, because I think he wants to exact some vengeance. But would you we'll play see. him on the second against the Oilers? No. Like that's you... what I mean. Uh, like anytime there's a team that has too good of a player or is too good of a team it's not optimal like edmonton while they're an absolutely dreadful team McDavid they still have could McDavid. Light him up. Yeah. yeah and you don't want to it, it's not fair to him like oh it's your second or third nhl start here have mcdavid you know like it's just not nice you know it, and it's not a fair representation like if he gives up five goals to mcdavid well, that's not a fair representation of how he'll play because he's just not used to going up against a guy that good. So you have to ease him in. And, you know, Mike Smith's used to playing against good players like that. So he's not as likely to get phased by, oh, it's McDavid. Uh, you know, so it, it, you have to pick your spots. And I think Riddick, if you play him against the right teams, it's more than fine. Looking at the back-to-backs we have coming up, in December we have Toronto-Montreal on the road, um, and then on the 28th and 29th we have San Jose-Anaheim on the road right after Christmas. Then in January we have a Tampa Bay-Florida road swing, and then later in January on the 24th, 25th, we have a a uh, home game against LA and a road game against Edmonton. So I think what I would do if I was the coach, I know where you're coming from about seeing what we have with Riddick, but I also think we need to see what we have with Gillies. I think if it was me, I'd split them up. I would let Riddick play the two back-to-backs in December and Gillies play the two back-to-backs in January. Hopefully then you've got kind of an equal body of work between the two and you can decide who you want to keep up for the rest of the year. I also think that lets one guy go down to the A and be the starter there for, say, a month. Gillies is used to that kind of workload. Riddick isn't really. So I think it'd be interesting to see, okay, you're not getting a lot of starts here in Calgary. How do you do going down to the A for, say, a month being the guy? Yeah, I could see that. I I think the games after Christmas, though, against San Jose and Anaheim, I think Smith gets both. But, you know... Could that would be, be me because uh, it's divisional opponents and they're both good teams. So yeah, that, that could be. But I mean, you could play Riddick against Montreal. Yeah. Um. You know, I think that you can get him somewhere in equal number of games. Oh yeah, for sure. Sa- same thing when we look at the January back to backs. I think Tampa and Florida. I would play the backup against Florida, but in L.A. Edmonton, I really don't want to put a backup in there. But maybe you put them in. You know, the game before in Buffalo. So you can yeah. always find an, a suitable opponent for your backup every month. Oh, yeah, for sure. But the fact both guys are, you know, waiver exempt, I think you will see the Flames move guys up and down. Yeah, and you need to get a, a book on how each of them will do at the NHL level so that way you can start to make decisions for next season as well. And That's it. And I know where you're coming from with Riddick, but I don't think you can really make that comparison until you've had almost an equal look at both guys. Oh, for sure. And it's just making sure that, oh, I can sign this guy. Like, he's worth keeping. And that's basically the barometer. Like, can he play at the NHL level at a quality enough level where you want him in the organization still? Otherwise, you just move on. Like, if he is not doing well in the NHL and is just doing great at the A, well, we have Parsons and McDonald still. So, like, you know make room the easy way 
but if he's playing well, then it's just a waste of an asset if you don't for sure keep him. So, and e, I think once you've kind of looked at, like I said, what I would do is I'd give say Riddick December. Uh, Gillies January then coming into February we've got three back-to-backs we have one against New Jersey New York Rangers one against Vegas Arizona one against Dallas Colorado I think whoever wins kind of that battle in in uh, January and or sorry December and January is going to get could get quite a few starts in February yeah I agree We've got some, you know, we got a couple games against Colorado there. We got a game against Vegas, who better be falling by that point. Um, I think that could be an easy month for a backup to get some starts. The next question I'll ask you that I've heard from a lot of people, what do you think about Parsons coming up? If the Flames ran into injury trouble, I'd have no problem with Parsons getting a starter to or being the starter for a while if the injuries are more severe but i think Um, if we get to that point we kiss our playoffs goodbye no not necessarily the flames are blessed right now with having five decent goalies in the system between gillies riddick smith black and parsons i mean you're saying parsons the starter you think if smith goes down and we've got the other guys that we can keep up the pace we've got smith has been bailing us out why not it's only a few weeks, so so okay. Yeah. So let's say pending an in pending no injury. Let's assume under normal circumstance. Of course, no, there's an injury. You do not. what you got to yeah. do. No, of course not. Uh, you is, if Smith is or Parsons is putting up Carey Price level numbers in the ECHL, awesome. Next year, do the same in the A. Then let's see what you can do it and maybe get a game or two in the NHL. And then the year after, okay, have fun. But I don't see any need to rush Parsons. You don't want to... You see, a lot of teams have that problem when they have a good goalie prospect is that they want him in the NHL right away. And you have to fight that urge because of the fact that you can ruin the player by overexposing him too quick. And I think... Partially, that's what happened to Mark andre Fleury. Even though he won three Stanley Cups, he was not really the driving force that he could have been. It, I think that if he wasn't exposed as an 18, 19-year-old where he's getting shot at like 50 shots against every game by the Penguins, I think he would have been a more solid carry price level goaltender instead of just an okay starter and i think that you have to balance that but by like how good he's doing and what's good for his overall long-term development now i think parsons could be that level of goaltender a bobrovsky price level goalie if he's brought along at the correct pace i don't think you want to rush him i don't think you leave him in the a for like three years either so as fans of course we want to see him but i agree with you especially for a guy who we saw early on struggling to adapt to the pro level i think it could be bad for his development to go say echl ahl nhl echl in the same year yeah i agree he's got to get comfortable somewhere yeah, and like say like there was a couple of goalie injuries, right? And uh, say Gillies and Riddick are the starters, Lack and Smith are out. Well, honestly, I'd leave Parsons in the ECHL and just bring McDonald up to be the starter in the A and just sign some fill-in backup for the A and just leave Parsons in the ECHL period just so he can keep the stability of being down there yeah and he's looking good right now i think that when a goalie's going on a tear you don't want to change anything no exactly and let him just basically kick everybody's butt down there and he'll be on the team when he's ready there's no need to rush him Uh, the team is not going to yeah, it's not like the Flames have, like, Brassois and Eddie Lack as the only goalie options. We're blessed to have goalie depth. Yeah, it, it's not like it's 
Parsons and then nothing else organizationally. The the Flames do have options. They can be patient. So why not be that? Yeah, I understand wanting to see Parsons as a fan, but I think the Sea of Red needs to be patient with this kid. We have to, I mean, if you look at the goaltending hierarchy, yes, I think Parsons might be the most. Now, now the thing is, is if Mike Smith got hurt in the last month of the season and the Flames were going to the playoffs, I would put Parsons in over Gillies, over Riddick, and I would have him be the starter. Just for the for the rest of the season? For the rest of the season in the playoffs, if that was the case. I, I think would. saying that now, based on what they've done, yes, I would want to see what Gillies and or Riddick do at the NHL level first. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I think that when it comes to the playoffs, you go with the best talent that you have possible. And Yeah, but ECHL hockey is so much more scrambling than the NHL. I'm not convinced Parsons could just jump up essentially two leagues and still be looking great. Yeah, well... It would be interesting to see. I think if it was, it came down to that. I think that's where I would go. Go with the risky option instead of what the I can. Safe what I can. Option. What I can see the Flames doing if Kansas City's not in a playoff spot is bringing Parsons up to the NHL as one of the sort of black aces. Yeah. That you see every year, not to get a start, but to be here to practice with the team to see what it's like. But I, I think that if Parsons is going in net for the playoffs. We're screwed. Like, I think Gillies or Riddich or someone who's played more AHL hockey, more structured hockey would be better. Lack would probably be better. I mean, at that point, call Jonas Enroth and get him over here. Like, there's... I, uh, I, oh, that, I, how would you say that? I think that when it comes to the playoffs, your team is... Like, if your starter goes down, you're pretty much screwed regardless. So... For me, it's not like normal operating procedure where you'd go with like Gillies or Riddick. I think you go with whoever has the most overall talent of who's I just left. think that you could blow Parsons' confidence there. You put him into a playoff game, he gets out beat, he gets out worked, and then it's all right, go home for the summer. You got all summer to stew over that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. It, it's one of those things that sometimes goalies do uh, very well in situations like that, like Matt Murray did, uh, Cam Ward did. Uh, yeah, Patrick but Murray, Law, Murray didn't Ken come Dryden, up from the, so. from the E right to the NHL for that. No, but... Ward didn't it, either. I think that's the big difference there. Yeah, well, Waugh and Dryden both did, and they had no That NHL was a different experience. time, too. Yeah, well... I talent, think if we look at talent rules out, so that's yeah. I I know where you're coming from. I think to me the Flames are best to keep Parsons in the ECHL. Maybe later in the season you bring him up to the AHL and give him a couple games, especially if we're moving goalies around. But I think his best development this year is playing as many games as he can at the ECHL level. I do like your idea about bringing McDonald potentially up to the AHL and give him a couple shots there to see what he's got. I think this whole goalie chain now brings a lot more movement than we thought we were going to have. Yeah, and I think that McDonald will get a few games in the A because he's doing fairly well in Kansas City as well. So he, And you also have to see and encourage him as well. It's not like he's vanished just because he had a couple of bad years like it, it, goalies are weird in that it usually takes them until they're 24 25 26 to sort themselves out so it's... well i think especially if we assume either riddick or gillies is going to make the nhl next year then we need to find somebody to replace them at the hl level exactly which i and think is I mcdonald think, yeah i think lack has gone either way this year and the winner of Riddich and Gillies is the backup next year, and Mason McDonald replaces whomever on the farm. And Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think Lack was always a one-year, and I've said this before, I think he was a one-year fill-in until they thought that either Riddick or um, Gillies was ready. Exactly. Now, as much as we've crapped on Lack, Lack has already played for the Stockton Heat. I was kind of curious when he got sent down if he'd actually report or not. Since the teams tell the guys don't report, and then there's, you know, less salary cap implications. But anyway, uh, Lack did play for the Heat on Saturday, surrendering just two goals, one off a screen shot while on a penalty kill. And that was scored by the uh, tied fifth leading scorer, Nick Merkley. And another was knocked in midair by the HL second leading scorer, Dylan Strom. Lack made 23 saves and helped the Heat snap their longest skid of the season in just two games. 
with six power plays surrendered to the HL's second best power play unit entering the game. Uh, Tucson really gave Lack. I watched some of this game. Tucson gave Lack quite a a challenge, and Lack stayed calm, cool, and collected between the pipes, impressing his teammates. So, sounds like Lack might be. I mean, one game is hard to judge, just like it's hard to judge Riddick after one game. But it sounds like Lack might be fine his game again at the HL level, and if he looks good. I wouldn't be against bringing him back up in February, March, even January. No, and that's why he got sent down. Uh, he's only played a couple of games, and frankly, they, the Flames probably could have just put him on like conditioning stint, but I think that they're wanting him to be down there a little longer. Than... I don't think you can do a conditioning stint unless yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. can. Yeah, if the player hasn't played for X number of games, you can do that. I've seen it. Other teams do that over the years, but uh, I I think they just wanted him to be able to play a little bit more, get half of the games in, so that way he can get back up to speed. Because I think that's part of what his problem was: is that he only played a couple of games instead of more. I think he's used to more of a workload, and it, I think that's part of the reason why he struggled so badly against Detroit that one game, is that he just it, it was just he too much rust. So and, and I think the good thing about the AHL schedule, for those that don't know, the AHL teams play a lot of weekend back-to-backs. Like if you look at their schedule, there's a lot more back-to-backs, and even sometimes three days in a row than there are at the NHL level. So being an AHL backup you're still going to see quite a bit of work. Like even looking at the schedule for this month, I'm looking at uh, they play December. Well, the, they play November 30th and December 1st. That's going to be a back-to-back. So you're pretty sure he's going to play in one of those. Then they play December 6th, 9th, 13th, 15th, 16th, 22nd, 23rd. So I can see between him and Gillies, there's enough workload for both of them there. Definitely. And I think, you know, you're not going to see him going like he did in Calgary 10, 15, 18 games without starting. No, and I think that was more to do with uh, just the weird first two months of the schedule where there was not really any onus to throw lack in there. Uh, there was enough time off between starts that Smith wasn't really getting burnt out very much. Yeah, I, I know where you're coming from, but I think at the same time, that's a great time to try out your backup and see what he's got and get him going. I think a lot of it did come from the fact that, okay, we have had rest. Smith is ready. We're more comfortable with Smith. Let's just throw him in. I think if you were comfortable enough with Lack, there's times when you would have said, okay, Smith is rest, rested, but let's give him a couple more days and throw Eddie in there. Yeah, I agree. But, I mean, Matt, we've seen, I mean, we went, what, 18 games in a row with Smith and Nett? Now that we have a new backup, right now it's Riddick, could be Gillies, could be someone else. What kind of timing do you think between backup starts we're going to see for the rest of the year? You can't be going 20 games in a row. With oh, no, I, I'm expecting the backup, whomever it is, to be playing more like every third or fourth game instead of like every 10th so yeah well and just looking at the schedule i think we have a schedule especially in december and january that affords that yeah like i still think that smith probably plays 60 to 65 games even though like he's played almost all of them this, thus far it's just that the, now the schedule is getting a lot more condensed so you're going to see the backup a lot more moving forward and we also have more Eastern Conference games coming up, which, I mean, if you've got to rest your goalie, you might as well rest him in a game that doesn't matter as much as a Western Conference game. So I can yeah, see Yeah, or even, those... uh, like, against the bottom feeders. Like, if you put Riddick out against Arizona or Colorado and you lose, it's like, eh, eh, you know, like, it doesn't really affect your playoff chances much, really. Well, and, and I think against those teams, too, you probably can't blame it all on the goalie if you're losing. True. Because those teams are terrible, and you should win. Like even if you had a really bad backup in net, like you sh should still come out with two points. I will just say for those that don't know, David Riddick is wearing number thirty-three in Calgary, and I love that Stockton and Calgary have such similar jerseys because these goalies come up here and they essentially already have Flames gear. Like even Riddick has the flaming C on the side of his helmet. So you don't get the you know you see sometimes the guy comes over and he's got just white pads or 
I remember one time, you know, you got a player in like Anaheim gear with San Jose pads, that sort of thing. And they've got the white helmets, so it's nice they can come up and down and everything looks the same. Oh, I know. It was like uh, seeing Dylan Ferguson for Vegas when he went in and like he's wearing green pads and yet he's with Vegas. And it's like, um, what? (laughs) Well, it was even, uh, what was it, last year when they got Backstrom from Minnesota? Yeah. And they got him a Flames mask, but I think he still had the red and green pads. Yeah, exactly. It just looks weird. Yeah, so it's kind of cool that the teams are so similar and that even the Flaming Sea is on Riddick's helmet without him actually playing here. So I'm happy with Riddick for now, but it's going to be really interesting to see how the Flames manage these Yeah, I like the gradient look on the actual uh, metal part of the mask, the face shield. It's kind of neat. I've never seen a goalie do that before i think before we get off david reddick we also have to give credit to whoever the flames uh scout in that region is you don't go to a lot of guys in the czech league and say wow this guy could be you know a potential starter in the nhl or even in the ahl the czech league i don't think is all that well scouted if you look at how many people bring over free agents from there so good for the flames for having their scout you know, find David Riddick and hopefully this is going to turn out a lot better than most of our European free agents like Trevanka, David Wolf. It looks like finally we've got it right. Well, that's why we have to see what he does at the NHL level. And you never know if he turns out to be a starter caliber guy. Well, Hey, that's awesome. You know, even if he's a backup guy. Yeah, it's awesome regardless. So we didn't bring in any European free agents this year, did we? Pribble no. was last year. Yeah, I don't think we did. I know that we, the Flames were interested in one guy, but uh, they haven't signed him yet. But Yeah, I don't think we brought anybody in this year. No. Well, that's okay. It left us room for Glenn Godden to sign. Yep. And what a trade that was, eh, with uh, Swift Current getting The Hitman two. trade? Yeah. Like, the Swift Current Broncos are basically now going to be the WHL champions, probably, just because of that trade. Like, they already have the best line with Godden, uh, um, Steenbergen, and I can't even remember It was, how what, like five for two that trade, wasn't it? Yeah, and that team's just so stacked now, so it's they're pretty much guaranteed. You know, good for Calgary, though, for realizing. I mean, they're struggling this year. The Hitmen aren't doing as well as they have in the past. Good for them for realizing, let's move on from these assets while we can and get some for them. Yeah, and realistically... Especially at the, the level, we don't see enough of that. Yeah, like, realistically, the Hitmen need to just basically tear down the spare parts and be bad for a year and then go for it after that. Yeah, I'm, uh, I haven't followed the Hitmen as closely this year as I usually do, but... Yeah, I know they're not doing that well, and I think that trade's really going to help them. Like you said, give them pieces to sort of rebuild. I mean, they got a great 15-year-old uh, goaltender prospect, and I think it was a good deal. And we need to see more of that at the NHL level, I think, saying we're going to give you our two best players to get a bunch of guys that we need. The and Duchesne I think, trade. Yeah, or, even even the Duchesne trade, though, I think was still pretty pinnacle pieces for pinnacle pieces. Yeah, but Colorado think, got a lot of good secondary parts to that so they did but i i think this when i saw the hitman trade the first thing that came through my mind is that is for the hitman what the iggy deal should have been for the flames i agree i think that they got rid of you know a couple key pieces and they got in a whole bunch of building blocks and i think you know now when we look back at the iggy deal i think you can pretty much besides what we get out of klimchuk and poirier you kind of go eh, i don't think we got enough out of that so i think that could really be a big building block there I agree. Well, Matt, you wanted to talk. We talked a little bit about it earlier, but some of the missteps on the defense this year. Anything else you want to talk about with the defensemen? Well, it's just uh, the... Well, you already covered the defense. It's more like just overall play from basically everybody besides the 3M line and the Kachuk... Or Gaudreau line. So the bottom six forwards. Yeah, and to their credit... The Jankowski, Bennett, and Yager line has been better lately, and like they're getting their cycle game is becoming a formidable thing. It's they they haven't been breaking through and scoring goals a lot lately, but that one's starting to come around. But the fourth line has just been borderline horrific for most of the season. 
See, I don't think this year you can fix that, though. I think the coaches are kind of looking at the fourth line as, I, I hate to use this word, but the line of regret. These are the players we shouldn't have here, but we can't get rid of. So let's just park them on the fourth line and play them enough that hopefully they're not going to get us into trouble. Well, that's exactly my point. Like, Verstig has been playing better, and now he's hurt again, unfortunately. But um, he's been playing a little better of late. But on the whole, like, moving Stajan out of the lineup was the right idea. I think that having Hamilton and Lazar in the lineup is not a good idea. And I think that the Flames should start to look to Stockton for replacements uh garnett hathaway and andrew manjapani are doing extremely well in stockton and i think it's getting to the point in the season where you need to start looking at maybe perhaps having troy brower and matt stajan be your 13th and 14th forward and having say lazar manjapani and hathaway as your fourth line 23 games in, I think we now know what we've got out of these guys. I, you know, I think we had to give them some rope early, give them some time to produce. I think you're right. Now we know what we've got. And I think even at this point, seeing that the Flames are willing to make moves from the farm, I mean, we saw Janko come up. We've seen Riddick come up. We're seeing that the Flames aren't afraid to make those recalls. I don't even think at this point I would keep staging right now as the 13th or, or sorry, 14th or 15th forward. I think if it was me, I'd send him to Stockton. Honestly, I'm not arguing with you. I, I I think the leadership he could bring as a veteran down there could be really helpful. And I've said this for a while. I think send him down, put the C on him. If he got down there at the beginning of the year, that's what I would have done. Is send him down, put the C on him, let him be the veteran guy to help all the kids. I'm not arguing with you. And it's unfortunate that the depth has been as bad as they have been. Because you don't like to see players fail, but uh, frankly, there is no other way to put it. The fourth line, especially, has been not at an NHL level. Any but at the same them. time, who's failing? Like, I mean, Brower, we didn't expect him to look good. Stajan, we didn't expect him to look good. To me, the disappointment there is Lazar. Yeah. Freddie uh, Hamilton's it, not expected to be, you know, a, a 20, 30, 40 game NHL player. No, uh, Lazar, to, to me, it's me, and, and Lazar that are underperforming. Everyone else is performing equally as poorly as I thought they would. Yeah. It's just that now it's like, okay, get those guys out of the lineup, period, then. And any way you have to. And frankly, I think that you keep Lazar just due to the fact that he's young. And, and he, he can play all three forward positions. Yeah, he's versatile and he's young. And, mm -hmm. you know, is he much different than, say, Shin Carrick or Poirier or Klimchuk? Not really. I don't think that there's much of any difference other than we paid a second-round pick to get Lazar. I was about to um, say, he's more expensive than the other guys. Yeah, but the difference is, is that he can play all three forward positions where the other guys are just solely wingers. It's one of those problems that... You just let him play anywhere you can fill in, basically. And I think the Flames would be better off having the energy because the third line has looked significantly better since Jankowski's been on it, frankly. And now that they're getting in a role in terms of their cycle game and generating offense that way, it hasn't gone in, but they're starting to look I think they're starting organized. to get some chemistry together. Yeah, and it's starting to look like a legitimate third option where you have Gaudreau's line, the 3M line, and now the Yager, Janko, and Bennett line where they're all clicking. It it hasn't happened yet, but you can see the engine starting to move. And the fourth line, though, has been a complete failure from day one, and it continues to be. And we're two months into the season, and nobody's improving. Everybody's terrible and changes need to be made and it, uh, it's harsh but you know the flames need to be better than this and when those guys are making the same mistakes game in game out and they're costing the team and you have quality prospects that are ready to play in the nhl swap them out 
I'm not saying that guys like Hathaway or Mangiapane should just be given a spot. I think like Janko, they should be brought up, given a chance, and have to you know play oh, well for to sure. earn that spot. For sure. I'm not arguing there. Like They have to, okay, you're doing better currently than these guys. Prove it at the NHL level, and if not, you're going back down. And yeah. that works for me entirely. It It's just, you have to, like, those guys are playing so well in Stockton. They're two of the top league scorers. You have to give them a shot, see what they have. It, especially, it would be a different conversation if Brower versus Stieg, Stajan, Lazar, Hamilton, they were all doing good. Because then there's no need to rush those guys then in. Then you've got a great veteran fourth line. Yeah, but when all five have been borderline disasters this year, it, it's you have and you have quality replacements. Well, put the quality replacements in, and if they stick, oh well, good for them. And they won the spots. Well, and that's what you want. You want that constant turnover. And we saw that in Hartley's first year too, right? Guys like Juris earned a spot on the team. And I think that's what we need to see here is if you're playing well in the A, we're going to give you a shot. You've got to play well at the NHL level to stay there, but at least now you know if you didn't stay, at least now you know the level you've got to get to. Yeah, and that was the same thing with Jankowski. He had a great camp, frankly, and he probably should have started the year in the NHL, but they sent him down and said, earn your way back, and he did. And the other two guys, to their credit, were off to a hot start as well, but they've kept it up since he's been gone, so they should get the same opportunity. There, there's no reason not to, and at least you can also get a, more of an idea of what those guys can do at the NHL level as well, which helps to figure out certain player acquisitions down the road as well. So, Matt, would you agree that if we look at a trade... If we look at, say, Brower, um, Stajan, Frolik, or sorry, not Frolik, Brower, Stajan versus Stieg, there's probably no trade value. Uh, for Brower, definitely, like, you'd have to pay significant. You'd have to, you'd have like, to eat like, up first, half that deal. Yeah, easily. He's making uh, 4.5 for three more years. That was a stupid contract. Yeah. Um, frankly, yeah. He'd be fine as the 13th forward, and that's about it. Um, I, I think as we get near the deadline, Stajan may have some trade value. Yeah. and like he might even 3.1 million. Yeah, I think he'd have some value even now. Uh, I don't think you'd get much for him either way. I think it'd the be like a seventh round The only issue with both pick. him and Brower is they've got no movements. Yeah, I know. Well, that's why 13th, 14th forward, and... You know, it's not ideal, but... So to bring those two kids up from the farm, let's focus specifically on Hathaway and Mangiapane. What do you do with the forwards? Who do you move out? Who do you send down? What would you do if you're GM? Uh, well, for me, what I would do, because Versteeg's out, is recall those two guys, send Hamilton, who's already cleared waivers, send him down, have Stajan and Brower in the press box, and have the fourth line being Mangiapane, Lazar, and Hathaway, and... Have see how it goes. Three kids, have fun, and let's see what you've got at the NHL level. And you know, experiment for a week. And when Versteeg comes back, send whichever the two wingers that you brought up is doing less well down, and keep the other guy up. You know, I really think that with Versteeg being hurt again, this could be. The end of his NHL career. Well, uh, I don't think it's that severe, but well, I don't you know. know. He's just—he's not that reliable. No, and look that, at last year—he's hurt for how long? Oh, I know, and that's why he's only getting what he got. One point seven. Of, yeah, instead of like three million, which is more appropriate for. He and Eddie Lack can both go find a place in in Europe to play. Yeah. What I would do at this point, I think I, I'm i okay with Freddie staying here. And, I mean, I'm okay with him either way. I think I'd send Freddie down. And I would also send – I would like to say Troy Brower down, but I can't see the Flames waving Brower and send him down. I think I would send down Freddie, and I would send down Matt Stajan. I'd wave Stajan. If somebody wants to take Stajan off our hands on waivers, fantastic. But I don't see anyone picking up $3.1 million on waivers. Send Freddie and Stajan down. Bring Hathaway and Mangiapane up. 
I'm hoping that sending Stajan down, you could get what we're hoping to get from Eddie Lack. Maybe playing at a lesser league, maybe being, you know, I mean, if you're bringing up two-thirds of your first line, you're going to need somebody to replace him. I could see Stajan being given top six minutes down there. You might be able to reignite just enough to make him a useful fourth liner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. None of these moves would be permanent. It's just maybe that it, they might, but it's you're not you're not you, you're, you're not getting it. You're selling it to Matt Stage, and then we're sending you down to get you some minutes. Yeah, and it, we're getting to the point where like changes need to be made. Like it, it's fundamentally broken the fourth line. Something needs to happen to shake it up, and the only way to do that realistically is personnel changes and that. It's the only like you've tried everything else you've switched out guys in and out of the lineup and nothing's really helped because all five of those players have been pretty poor for most of the season so now it's on to actual personnel changes and it's unfortunate but nobody's been stepping up to actually keep their spots Sam Ben is 21. Curtis Lazar is 22. I think you definitely keep Curtis Lazar here. If he was not waiver eligible, I might say send him down for, you know, a couple of games, see what he can do. But I think Lazar is young enough. He could still come around. But yeah, I think you've got to send um, Stajan down. The only thing I'm not convinced about is that bringing Mangiapani up for the fourth line is the right idea. I think Mangiapane definitely needs a look, but I'm not sure the fourth line is the right place for him. I'm almost thinking, and tell me what you think of this, if this is crazy. You look at the fourth line of being, pick your centerman, uh, Curtis Lazar, Garnet Hathaway, and maybe somebody like Gadzik. Uh, no, I think that, like, you look at Nashville, like uh, Frederick Gaudreau uh, with them. He's a similar-ish prospect. Uh, a lot of offensive skill, but is a shorter player like Mangiapane. And they brought him up into the fourth line and kind of eased him into their lineup. And in a case like that, you're telling the player that be opportunistic offensively, but basically focus on defense. And even though he's an offensive player, he's also a good defensive player. And he's a very smart player overall. And... Even just easing him into the fourth line allows him to see what it is like at the NHL level, for one, and two, to understand what he needs to do at the NHL level to stick. And I think that he's not good enough offensively to be a top six forward, I don't think. And so he needs to be able to figure out how to play bottom six minutes and be a solid contributor. And I think that the only way to do that is to actually just put them in and see. Yeah, I know where you're coming from. I just think that for the, if you were to look at, say, a Lazar or a Stajan, Hathaway, and um, Mangiapani, I just think Mangiapani's play style is very different from those guys. I think I would almost rather see Mangiapani on a line with, say, a um, Versteeg, Lazar and him I think he I just don't know he would blend well on that fourth line I don't think he's kind of the gritty guy you need for your fourth line and that's it's, the only reason I'm thinking maybe you don't bring him up yet and maybe you wait till the next injury to the top top nine and bring him up then yeah like I, I don't disagree that he should come up but I don't think you should just call a guy up because he's been playing well if you're not putting him in a spot where he can succeed and I don't know the putting him on that fourth line especially with I mean let's say they put him out there with Brower Brower's going to drag him down oh yeah you know um, Stajan's going to drag him down so I think that you've got to be careful I think we know we've got out of Hathaway and I think Hathaway can play well in that kind of role but I just don't want Mangiapane to come up to essentially be saddled with some dead weight and kind of said, all right, kid, go out there and look good when there's no way to look good with those guys. So I'm wondering if maybe maybe you only bring up Hathaway at this point and maybe... You or know, just Mangiapane or one or the other. Yeah, I can you, see that. You know, I just I think even if you just bring up Mangiapane, though, there's nowhere to put him in the top nine. Like yeah. unless you, you know, and, and I think that's where he's got to be to have a chance to look successful this year. I think I would bring up Hathaway and do Hamilton... Lazar and Hathaway as my fourth line. And I think you might be able to get some out of that. 
I just don't want Mangiapane to kind of be saddled with, all right, here's the extra pieces, and you go out there and look good, kid, because there's no way to look good if you're playing with Brower and Stajan or if you're playing with, you know, Hamilton now, and Brower. Now, here's, here's another thought. Bring up both Mangiapane and Hathaway and have the third line being Mangiapane, Jankowski, and Yager, and the fourth line being Bennett, Lazar, and Hathaway. I thought about that, but at this point, with a third line rolling the way it is, I'm not sure I want to mess with it that much. We're just getting going with that one. I don't know. I want to start breaking it up. I don't know. It's it's tough to tell, but I just don't see the need to... I mean, Mangiapane's in his first pro season. I don't see the rush to bring him up. Yeah, he's playing well, but I think he'll get a shot here at some point. I'm just not sure now is the right time. Yeah. I agree. Honestly, if you want to bring up a sort of an energy guy to play on that third line, I think it's time the Flames start looking at somebody like a Klimchuk or a Shinkarik. And I think those guys might fit better in a fourth line energy spot than I think Mangiapani would this year. Yeah, they're I can also say that. they're also older guys who the Flames are gonna have to make a decision on earlier. Like I, I think Mangiapane is very similar to what we talked about with Parsons, where he's playing well. We want to see him here. We want to bring him up to Calgary. But I don't want to bring them up and set them up to fail. I think you almost have to at some point say, you know what, kid, you're doing good. Keep doing good, and you'll get your shot. And I think right now I would say, yeah, let's bring up a Hathaway, who I think we've known for a few years has been on the verge of an NHL spot. I think, you know, Merrick Rivick. Uh, Hunter Shinkarik, Morgan Klimchuk, some of these older guys, even Emil Poirier, and say, I actually think Emil could do really well on that line. But I think some of those older guys say, all right, we're bringing you up to see what we've got. This is your chance to show us what you're doing. I agree. You know, and, and let, I also don't want to decimate Stockton. Because then, you know, you're going to ruin their momentum. I think keeping at least one of their top six down there is going to be good for them. So I don't necessarily want to bring Gadzik up, but when I said Gadzik, I was kind of meaning more of a a senior player. Yeah. So I, I you know, I could see bringing up um, Emil Poirier for. Um, oh Vistique. yeah, you you could throw any number of those guys. Like you'd even throw Spencer Fu up there if you wanted to. Like there's a lot of different options. Yeah. I, again, I think Fu. Uh, yeah, I, I know. I wouldn't bring up anyone in their first year. No. I can I see that. I leave agree. Leave all those guys in Stockton. So I think if we're looking at what have we got, you've got to assess the senior players. I mean, do we really know what we have in Shinkarik? Do we really know what we have in Klimchuk? Do we really know what we have in, you know, some of these guys, um, you know, Poirier? I think those are the guys. Even, it, heck, if you want an energy guy for the fourth line, bring up Lomberg. Like, I just think that there's other guys there that would fit better in a low-minute fourth line and maybe guys who might look better being dragged down by either Stajan or Brower. I don't know that Mangiapane is one of those guys. I, I want Mangiapane definitely to come up, and I think as soon as you get an injury to the top nine, he's coming up. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think if you were to look at, yeah, Klimchuk or Shinkarik, I'm just looking through the roster here, Klimchuk, Shinkarik, Poirier, um... Those are, and I think an outside chance would be Lomberg. That's that's what I would do if I was GM. No, yeah. and I think some of it comes with age too. You know, yeah, you're looking good, but these guys have been around longer. These guys are maybe a little bit higher on yeah, the depth chart. Yeah, it's sort chart. of like uh, before when like the Flames recalled Greg Nemus just to see if you know, or Chris Chucko just to see if they could. I actually just shuddered stick when you it. said those names. Yeah, I know. But gave him a shot at the NHL level to see if there was anything there there before moving on. <laughs> well, and yeah. I think you and I both said that, you know, coming into this year with all the hype the Flames put behind Emil Poirier, I know I expect him to make the team. Like just the way they'd hyped him and his recovery, I expect him to start here. And I think I mean, I don't know how old he is now, but he's getting older as a well, he and Monaghan are the same age, so twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. Uh, he's twenty two. Like, yeah. So, you know, I mean, he lost uh, almost half an AHL year, but I think that's a guy, you know, Shin Carrick. I think all these guys, you've got to make a decision on soon. You don't want them to be the next Watherspoon who just hangs around because we need filler guys. And I think that there could still be some value in some of those guys. If you decide you don't want them, let's move them out and get an asset. I mean, even if we do, you know, like we did with some of our guys, um, you know, like Reinhardt, get a fourth for him. 
but we've got to know if we want to keep them or not. So that's what I'd be doing at this point. But yeah, I definitely agree with you. That fourth line needs to be fixed. It can't just be a dumping ground for bad contracts. And I think once the Flames can get out from some of these deals, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with that money. I think once we're out of the staging deal this year, there's no doubt in my mind most of that money goes to Backland. Yeah, I agree. My big question is, do you think that we see Brower stay here and we, whether in the NHL or the AHL, we eat his contract? Do you think we can find a sucker to take him at half his money? Or do you think the Flames will end up buying him out? That's a big buyout. Well, I think uh, what Brower, I think where he'll be in the roster for this year and then next year, either he'll be the 13th forward or in the AHL. And uh, if the flames can't trade him and unless he plays well enough and which there's no real indication that that'll happen and then buy him out at the end of next year when the buyout's not too severe. Yeah. I mean, if you're in the 13th forward, you're really not even going to get the chance to showcase yourself to try and play that well. No. Um, I don't know. It's, I, I think the the rule that Tree Living has to look at is no more signing wingers on July 1st, big veteran wingers. I think we wait till August when they're cheap because between him and Froelich, I think we spent Well, realistically, too much money. the Flames should have guys coming through the organization in the next little bit, like Mangiapane. Yeah, but right. I don't think anyone you slot into line one. Like both him and Froelich were expected to be the first line right. Not really. When they oh, signed Brower, they were talking about him being a first line guy. Yeah, but uh, more penciling him in, not like expectations that he'd stick. I don't know, money wise, that's what you're looking to pay a top six guy. Yeah, I know. Well, it didn't work out, but it happens. So every yeah, te- I, every team's got a bad contract somewhere, and ours is Brower. We yeah, so. we got a couple of them. What do you think the likelihood if you're going to send one of the veteran guys, let's say Stajan or Brower to the A, what do you think the likelihood is that's Brower over Stajan? zero uh you can't really yeah because you'll tank the asset like it there may be a possibility next year of moving brower in the off season i don't see the ability to do that like like if you send him to the a like you're saying that okay he's bad like really really bad and like while he's but i think any coach can see that by watching the video on him yeah, but you know, it it just further tanks his value and basically like you're just stuck with the money where like you may be able to move him potentially in a trade where like another team might have the same type of a problem. And yeah, the the Flames different, also different. want their HL team to be competitive and I think you can still be competitive maybe with stage in there. Brower's just dead weight. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd keep him in as a 13th forward. He can eat press box popcorn. Yep. Well, Matt, anything else you want to talk about? That's all, folks. Well, why don't we look at our polls? Let's look at our polls then. So last week we asked everybody about Mike Smith and how many starts they thought he'd get. Um, 20% of our respondents thought 50 to 55 games is where he'd get. 10% 10% thought 55 to 60, and the majority of people thought that he'd get 60 to 65, which I think is right about where you and I are as well. We also 10% thinking more than 70, and I think if we see him in more than 70 games this year, we got no chance at the playoffs. No. Like that, old... that, that's just not really feasible. Like, it, it, Yeah, it, if he's playing that much, our goaltending throughout – like honestly, the backups would be that terrible, where like you may actually see Parsons play. Like that's how bad the goalies would be playing for that to happen. I think for that to happen, you'd almost have to cycle everybody, including Lack, back through first. Yeah, and I yeah, that just won't happen. <laughs> but I mean, to play that many games, you almost you can't even evaluate the other guys. That's what like looking at where we are now. It's like two games a piece. Yeah, I know. Like uh, that's it's just not going to happen. So the poll for this week talking about goaltending is how would you split up the Flames backup duties for the rest of the season? The options we have, number 1, it's David Riddick's job to lose. Number 2, send Riddick down and bring Parsons or Gillies up. Maybe you disagree with us and think Parsons should be up here. 
Number three, try both Gillies and Riddick and see who performs better. Number four, bring Eddie Lack back once at a few good AHL starts. Or number five, what I'll call the nuclear option, we need a trade for a qualified NHL backup. Maybe we can find somebody to take Stajan or Brower or Lazar and give us a backup. I bet Niemi's going to be available. Is 30-team so, tour this year? Maybe you can collect all the jer- – well, 30, 31 if you collect oh, yeah, them all yeah, this year. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. So he can be the first player to play for all 31 teams. Well, those are the options for this week. Um, that's Hopefully we'll hear from you guys and see what you have to say. I think this is going to be an interesting one because I know there's a lot of dissenting opinions on this one. And Matt, before we get out of here, let's look ahead at the Calgary Flames week. We've got the Flames back in the Dome. Uh, the 28th, they play against Toronto. The 30th, they play against Arizona. Saturday, we welcome our arch rivals, the Edmonton Oilers. And then Monday is a rematch against the Philadelphia Flyers to end out that season series. So four games at home. What are you thinking on the series? 2-2. Two, 2-2? Two. Two, two? Which two? Uh, the Arizona, Phoenix, uh, Arizona and Philadelphia games. I don't, We're- I don't think that they'll beat uh, Toronto or Edmonton. You think we fall to Edmonton? Yeah. Oh, that pains me to hear. Yeah. Oh, I, you got to figure that Edmonton is looking to have any redeemable thing of their season, and beating Calgary is like their Stanley Cup. So, yeah. <laughs> well, they, 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 the they certainly aren't getting it this year. So, you know, we got to give them something. All right, I'm going to go a little bit like different. I, you, you. you already know that they're going to be talking about McDavid's first game of the season, like the entire game that day. So. I think that one will probably mute it and just listen to the radio guys. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Especially because that's a Saturday Hockey Night in Canada game. Oh, I know, and that's why it's just going to be all McDavid all day talking all about right. his heroics in the first game. And I'm going to go. Oh, since. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It'll be McDavid and his heroics in that game and what he ate for lunch that day. Like, it seems to be all they want to talk about, even if he's not playing. It's what's Connor McDavid doing in the other game? Oh, I know. Well, it was the same thing with Sidney Crosby when he first came in the league, and it's just marketing BS. And McDavid's not playing tonight. Which video game do you guys think he's playing? Um, I'm going to go a little bit differently than you. I think Calgary's going to fall to Toronto. I think Toronto's looking really hot right now, and I think they're going to probably come out early and I think beat Calgary down early and Calgary won't be able to come back. I think we beat the Coyotes. We better beat the Coyotes, and I think we'll see David Riddick and Nett there. I agree. I think Calgary will beat Edmonton. I think... I I really think this is the game where the secondary scoring is going to come alive. I see at least a couple goals from the Yager, Janko, Bennett, line in this one to to get the Flames the win. I think they, that will be either the winning factor or the lo- losing factor in that one is that line. And I think the Flames will lose to Philly. So I'm going two games as well, but I think it'll be a different two than you did. Uh, and so hopefully we, we're wrong on a more positive side where like we win three or four of the four. But Just we'll looking, at, looking at how we've done so far, kind of in four game segments, that seems about right. Yeah, and this team, like, once they get rid of the stupid mistakes that, like, they just shouldn't be making, then realistically, like, three out of four should be more what they're capable of. It's just, unfortunately, too many minor mistakes that are causing major problems. (laughs) As we look at the December schedule, really up until Christmas, this team is playing every other day. I mean, there's a couple back-to-backs here, but we make up for it. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how the Flames play when we have what I'd call a more normal NHL schedule. We don't have four or five-day breaks anymore. And I think this is really going to be the test of, like you were saying earlier, yeah, okay, we've had a week off or four days off. Mike Smith looks good, but how is Smith going to look when he's playing every other day? Yeah, and that's why you'll see Riddick probably get four or five games over the next month or two type of thing to, you know, more of a balanced schedule instead of it being the Mike Smith show. And the Flames have been doing pretty good health-wise. As we start to play more games, I think you are going to see more guys getting banged up, and that might be where you see guys like Mangiapane getting their recall pretty soon. 
Well, Matt, that's it for this week. I will talk to you next week after the four-game homestand before the Flames head off to Eastern Canada to take on Toronto and Montreal on the road. Thanks for listening, everybody, and hopefully it's a good week for Calgary. Disappointing about the Grey Cup, but uh, it happens, unfortunately. The Flames have to redeem Calgary in the sports world. We play yes. Toronto in hockey. we got to beat Toronto in hockey instead. Yeah, or we'll get up to like a 5-1 lead and then lose in the last minute. Don't oh, say like, that. We're done with that. <laughs> that was bad. But oh, well. it happens. Oh, well. How much you can do? It, wouldn't it be funny if the Flames and, or, and uh, Maple Leafs play like 27-24? Oh, God. Everybody, a goal for you and a goal for you. Everybody gets a goal. Well, Gaudreau better win the scoring title. Then. <laughs> Broward get a hat trick in that one. All right. I'll talk to you next week, Matt. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.